Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes, and your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. We thank you so much for your continued support. Twit.tv slash survey. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by DX Engineering. DX Engineering offers practically everything you need to outfit your shack, plus the fastest shipping in the industry. In-stock items ship the same day, Monday through Friday, until 10 p.m. Eastern. For more information, visit dxengineering.com slash hamnation. And by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash hamnation. This is Ham Nation, episode number 190, April 1st, 2015. Christian brings us the perfect Elmer. Good evening, everybody. I know it's April Fool's Day, and that might mean a lot to a lot of people, but <laughs> this is Ham Nation you're dialed into here on the Twit Network. I'm Bob Heil, K9EID. I'm coming from the Ozarks tonight via Exceed, the old satellite delivery service. Got a new microphone on here tonight. That's cool. A new PR10 works great. And, uh, uh, the bass lights up when you hit the push to talk switch. It's pretty cool stuff what's going on here. And we have a really interesting show tonight. I mean, this is a, all of them are great, but a little bit the more going on tonight. And Valerie is here. And of course, Don is here. George is here. Amanda's standing by taking all the questions in the chat room. So you chat room guys, you uh, start lining up, and get some questions. But we're going to go down to Costa Mesa first. And we're going to visit with Gordon. Gordon, how you doing? I am fine. And I'm delighted to say, look at this, March issue of CQ magazine. And I've already seen the digital rendition of April issue that has a funny April Fool's joke. So CQ is doing great. Also doing great are the signups to the DX convention, Bob, coming April 17, 18, and 19 in Visalia. It's going to be big. And then I look forward to seeing all those of you in the Sierra Nevadas at the ARRL Nevada Convention near Reno, Boomtown, May 1, 2, and 3. And then I'll let you tell everyone, Bob, about the upcoming activities in uh, Dayton coming up mid-May. Uh, but wait a minute. <clears throat> bulletin, bulletin. From the Amateur Radio Relay League, this uh, bulletin. Now, that is not to be confused with the American Radio Relay League, but rather the Amateur Radio Relay uh, League. Um, they're going to be amending the Q codes. And um, <clears throat> the FCC says, sure, go ahead. Uh, the uh, Amateur Radio Relay League says, sure. And some of the new Q codes, QET, phone home. Uh, QEW, uh, say again, <laughs> earwax. QLF, I Ew. am sending with my left foot. This one I like. QBO, don't sit next to that guy at the next club meeting. Get it? QBO. <laughs> All right. Anyway, and finally, uh, QBS, yes, it is getting deep in here. Uh, happy April Fool's Day. And look at this. This is no April Fool. This from Jim's Engraving, Lexan Acrylic. Is that great? He's got an acrylic stand, so now I can take yes. his great uh, name stands through TSA and not have him wanting to completely take it apart. So thanks to Jim's Engraving, you can order them too. They are acrylic at Jim's Engraving. That's what you look up. So, Bob, back to you on April Fool's Day. Yeah, you see that date on that yeah, calendar? Yeah, it's April Fool's. Thank you very much for that. 
Jim is really a great guy. It, 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 all of you, please do me a favor. Go check out Jim's Engraving. He's got a wonderful site. He's a, he's a veteran, and, and this is what he's doing uh, to make things uh, happen, and he's, he's really talented. I'm really, uh, I've always been excited to be a friend of Jim's, but uh, he's doing all these signs for all of us here on Ham Nation. It's really cool. Well, um, big things are going to happen in Dayton. We uh, found out that we will be, again, uh, doing the Ham Nation uh, show, probably about 15 minutes, What, uh, how it all works out, uh, on Saturday. And we're going to be live with Leo, Leo Laporte. Yeah, if, if you never followed his Tech Guy show, you need to do that on Saturday, Sunday. It's really amazing show. He's on... Uh, 150 radio stations on the premier network and uh, just a, a whole bunch of uh, uh, viewers and listeners to that. Well, he's invited uh, us to be back there with him again. And Exceed is bringing in a special uplink truck. So we have a really great signal back to him because the internet in Dayton ha Arena, Adara Arena is not a good, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> is that <laughs> that's saying it nicely i think don't you think gordo it's not uh, a good yes <laughs> but um exceeds coming in with the big boys and uh, so we'll have a signal back and uh, we'll all be there uh, to um to talk to leo and all of you on his radio show on saturday we'll have more about that in specific time so we're very excited to be back uh uh from uh, the dayton uh Hamvention with uh, with Leo. It's it's really a pleasure and an honor, really, to be there. Well, I wanted also to uh, let you know that tonight we're going to have Christian live. So for all you guys and gals that's been enjoying his new ham segment, wait till you see what's going to happen now. But before we do that, we're going to go get a little bit more from Gordon and uh, see what he's got in the way of happenings down there in Costa Mesa. Wow, do you hear that? Hawaii is calling, and that's the Hawaiian beacon coming in here to Costa Mesa, 2,500 miles away. The beacon is on the air on both 2 meters, 432, and 1296, 24-7. And oh, well, hey. lately, we've been hearing the beacon coming in loud and clear for the last three days. Now, the Hawaiian beacon, constantly on the air with about 50 watts of power, scoots over that fog bank that you see on the horizon because that fog bank creates right above it warm air and normally air every 300 feet of elevation we lose one degree every mile up we lose 20 degrees of air well what occurs during an inversion between here and Hawaii is a 10 degree bump in temperature up and that triggers the tropospheric duct. So the beacons on the Mauna Loa volcano are on the air 24-7, and we're beginning to pick them up two months early. Normally, we always hear them in July, but now they're coming through loud and clear. And this is the antenna I use at my end to pick up the beacons, a pair of long boomers. 2,500 miles away. And the same path exists between Boston and Key West and between Texas and Key West and between uh, Nova Scotia. As you can see, these are all the tropo paths that only occur in the presence of a high pressure system. So when you see a big high come over, you know things are going to happen. And wow, look at this. This is like a waveguide between Southern California, upper right, and Hawaii, middle left. And this is a water vapor pattern. And as you can see, conditions are just right for that tropospheric duct and that inversion layer to come up 10 degrees. And when it comes up 10 degrees over this uh, low-lying clouds magic things happen. And the Hepburn report, you can see, uh, Google Hepburn report, and you can see the uh, path between here and uh, Hawaii is looking good. Yellows is what we're looking for. Normally, in normal air, the higher we go in altitude, temperature goes down. Same thing with water vapor. It gets more dry. 
But during a temperature inversion, it creates a tropospheric duct, much like a waveguide, that can actually bend light waves and actually bend through refraction radio waves. And the way we illustrate that is with uh, layers of liquids that uh, begin to settle in. And as you can see, line of sight, a straight line on VHF, is no longer a straight line, but rather it follows the curvature of the Earth as long as that duct is in place at 10 degrees warmer. Uh, aboard boats on radar, they can actually see an inversion layer. And uh, if you uh, had a, a nomograph, you would see that at about the 500-foot level, the temperature comes back up. This is only about a three-degree change. It takes 10 degrees to trigger the tropoduct between here and Hawaii. And uh, even in the water, we'll see that uh, temperature variations called thermoclines will cause um, uh, sound waves to bounce back off of uh, phantom objects. And it's that warm air mass above the cold air below, the cool seawater, that triggers 2,500 miles between here and Hawaii. Now, you've all seen the effects of a mirage. Look at that. Those trucks are not going into water, but you're actually looking at the blue sky. It's refracting that sky back to where you're looking at it. So what looks like water is not. So that is a mirage. Now, we've actually seen mirages in the tropoduct. Here's our island 26 miles across the sea normally with a few birds. And during tropospheric ducting, look what happens from sea level up to about 500 feet. That isthmus now becomes flying saucer looking. And now there's a highway over the isthmus. There really isn't a highway. And now there's a big gap. That is all because of tropospheric ducting. And on radio waves, <clears throat> they get caught up in that tropospheric duct. So the gang in Hawaii says the beacons are doing great. So for those of you along the West Coast, know that the Hawaii team is up there making things happen. And Bob Newcomb, WH6 X-Ray Mike, tells me that uh, Hawaiian hams, both at the beacon site, as we uh, see here on the air, as well as hams like he down in Hilo are ready to start working us here on the West Coast as soon as the band opens. That's Chip K7JA getting ready. I'm helping them assemble the beams because down at this end of the duct, the radio waves from Hawaii tend to be right at sea level. So while Chip's working the bands, uh, I'm out there uh, taking just a few, not radio waves, but ocean waves. That one's ready to close out. Ed Hammond, you East Coasters, you all know Ed Hammond. He talks about working all the way to Florida from up in the uh, East Coast area, Boston. Uh, of course, that was back in the old days. So here's ham radio at its best. Volunteers getting those uh, antennas all pointed toward the West Coast. <clears throat> it's a little tin hut that encloses all of the equipment. There's a hardworking crew of the Hawaiian team. And um, it takes just a horizontal antenna to be able to get into two meters and 432. That's the omnidirectional one on our comm band. <clears throat> Here's one that uh, Chip has through Innov antennas ready to work Hawaii. And um, here's a, a neighbor down the street with a monster array that can work Hawaii even on the 222 band. And um, there's Leo and team uh, getting ready to uh, congratulate the Hawaiians for getting a signal all the way over here. And it all happens on single sideband and CW down at the bottom of the band, 144-200, as well as 432-100. So our uh, Paul KH6HME, unfortunately a silent key, but Paul has... Uh, Got from the Paley gods uh, this little bit of lava from the repeater site, and this brings us good luck. So I hope all of you this summer, beginning about July 1st, will have an opportunity to work simplex and talk both FM as well as sideband hundreds, if not a thousand miles away in the presence of a tropospheric duck. And that's no fooling on April Fool's Day. Bob? 
<laughs> That's great, Gordo. I really enjoy seeing and hearing some of the activities you guys do. Uh, not going to do it from Missouri. We'll just be working in Missouri uh, a CUSO party this weekend while you guys are <laughs> working big time stuff. <laughs> well, we want to uh, go hear a little bit from Don to tell us about what's going on at DX Engineering. Don, take it away. Hey, there's all kinds of cool stuff going on at DX Engineering. It, it, as Gordon showed you, it's DX season. It's that time to go and hit the tropo between him and and Hawaii. It's all it's well, it's antenna season because it's springtime, and that ain't no fooling. If you're looking for a new multiband Yagi that will give you monoband performance, you want to check out the Navasa Five from JK Antennas. And it's right there at DX Engineering. It's a wonderful choice if you want to get on the most popular HF bands or if you want to upgrade from a tri-band trap antenna. The only place you can get the Nafasa 5 is, you guessed it, DX Engineering. It's based on a collaborative design by Daniel Horvat, uh, E73M, uh, N4EXA also is his call sign. It puts five full-size elements along the, pl the same plane. Now, that means you get two uh, element monoband performance in a five-band antenna. 10 through 20 meters, including the warp bands, through a single run of coax cable. It's got a wide flat SWR curve, gives you wonderful wide band performance. It's also very compact and fairly lightweight. And this is springtime and, and the wind season, especially in Oklahoma, as we'll see a little bit later on with what happened to a radio station antenna there. This thing will withstand winds up to 100 miles an hour and the turning radius is just a little bit over 19 feet. So it'll fit on practically every lot out there, even the smallest. And for even more band coverage, there's an optional six meter add-on kit for the Navasa 5 and DX Engineering. Again, the only place you can get this brand new antenna. Uh, winter was a little harsh for most in the U.S. In some places it still is. And if your antenna's have been feeling the fury of Mother Nature, uh, not feeling the love from Mom. Well, DX Engineering has everything you need to get them back in shape. Quality aluminum and fiberglass tubing to build an antenna or a light-duty mask. Uh, available in many lengths, multiple outsized, uh, outside diameters as well, and they will smoothly telescope inside each other. So uh, either slit or non-slit ends, depending on clamping, telescoping, application. Perfect tubing if you're looking for maximum strength even at long assembly lengths. If you like to build your stuff, DX Engineering fiberglass tubing is ideal to support your antennas. Also, uh, they have quad spreaders, uh, perfect for that, uh, insulating stacking frames. You can get eight-foot telescoping lengths in multiple diameters uh, for push-up masts. You can also repair your antennas with professional spec clamps, everyone made to exact tubing OD sizes for the amateur radio community. Ideal if you want to build a new antenna or even repair or upgrade your existing antenna. There are also isolating clamps that work well for isolating elements in Yagi builds, all kinds of stuff for any antenna project you have out there. Call DX Engineering because they ship faster than anybody else in the industry. If you get your order in by 10 o'clock Eastern tonight and it's in stock, it'll be on a truck headed your way tonight. Proven Products Expert Advice DX Engineering helping you shrink the globe. Request your catalog or shop online 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. DXEngineering.com slash Ham Nation. We thank DX Engineering for their support of our little program we like to call Ham Nation. And of course, Tim Duffy, K3LR, is the uh, big chief muckety-muck over there. And he's doing the Antenna Forum at Dayton, as he always does. And of course, you know, last week we told you that uh, Dr. Tamitha Scove was going to be there. Well, we have another fabulous announcement about the antenna forum this one is like me if you're not going to be at dayton it doesn't mean you have to miss it brian the 2015 dayton hamvention antenna forum is friday may 15th uh we were gonna videotape the thing but some bonehead broke the betamax <laughs> we put our hands together and came up with a solution do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! That's right, we're doing it live! <laughs> ICOM will live stream the 2015 Dayton Hamvention Antenna Forum. Friday, May 15th, 2 p.m., Forum Room 1. Tim Duffy, K3LR. Solar weather with Dr. Tamitha Sco. Arecibo. Antenna analyzers. Quadcopters and more. Don't miss it. Yeah, it's going to be pretty <laughs> exciting. <laughs> going to be pretty exciting and uh, you can see it live. ICOMAmerica.com will stream that live for you. So uh, be, be, be looking out for that. There's going to be a look at antenna analyzers from... Uh, W1ZR, a review of popular antenna analyzers. Of course, Dr. Tamitha Scove will be there uh, with the science of predicting space weather and how it affects propagation. That's going to be cool. Quadcopter drone-assisted real-world antenna pattern measurements 
And, uh, of course, uh, Tim Duffy with a behind-the-scenes tour of the world's largest antenna at Arecibo with uh, WP3R. It's going to be an amazing forum, the Antenna Forum at Dayton. That is uh, Dayton Friday, and if you cannot be there uh, live, you can still be there uh, through the... Uh, through the facilities of icomamerica.com, streaming it live. So there you go. We'll do it live because that's what we do here at <laughs> Ham Nation. I mean, scream and I had an O'Reilly moment. But, uh, Bob, there you yes. go. Let's uh, Speaking of live, we got Christian live tonight, don't we? We do. We do. And before we leave that subject, you uh, need to also add that Tim Duffy, K3LR, is the Ooh. amateur radio operator yes. of the year. So He'll be awarded out. that at date. Right. Yeah, yeah. So that'll all be uh, live also. So you'll get to see that in the, the stream. So we'll give you more information each week as we get closer. But uh, all good stuff, especially with uh, everything going on this year at Dayton. It's going to be fun. And for some reason, if you can't be there, we can um, make sure you do uh, take a look at the live stream. And thanks to ICOM for doing that. Well, we have had such great response from this new segment, a new ham. And um, what's interesting about it is it's uh, being done by a new ham. Uh, <laughs> met Christian. I'm sure you heard the story. I told you a couple of times. He, we met years ago and he did a documentary on uh, Heil Sound and all that when we were doing the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame stuff. Why, He did a really nice, uh, nice video about it and he's got interested in ham radio because he had this old receiver he told me about well here we are uh coming up this past summer he got his license and so i asked him to come on and talk about all that and he took this over because he's a tv producer that's what we aren't we're just hams but he's a real live dude but i said we never get to see you so christian welcome uh, live tonight how are you doing you okay you know you, I'm great. Thank you for having me. But you had to have Don talking about antennas. You know, I've got a weird antenna problem right now. I've, uh, you've given me this sickness, and now I'm <laughs> analyzing dipoles. I'm, I'm building one. I, I just bought a bunch of stuff from DX Engineering. So uh, I think you're just teasing me a little bit. And then Don frightened me a little bit with the O'Reilly thing, and I snapped out of it a bit. But uh -huh. <laughs> no, I'm having a good time. I'm, I'm working on a fan dipole right now. It, it should go up in an oak tree soon. Well, we will be talking to you on it. Just like I said, put the stupid thing up, see if it works. Get it close in resonance and have fun. You'll be surprised. So you've got a really nice segment tonight. So let's uh, turn it over to you and let you uh, bring on the good stuff about some new hams. Sure thing. We can do that. You know, in a few weeks ago, it's almost been a month now, you put the call out to send your your emails and tell us your stories. And, you know, you don't have to be a young ham. You don't need to be eight years old or 16 years old or 12 or whatever. You can be an older ham and, and have a great story. And tonight, um, from this data we're collecting, from these stories, we're finding a, a lot of uh, interesting shades. So I'm trying to pick out different aspects of this hobby uh, to highlight. And so tonight we have two hams on two sides of the same coin. One is very active. He's an extra class license. The other is his friend. They're in Virginia. They live about an hour away from each other. But the technician became discouraged. So, Brian, we're going to get ready to roll this here. But I think the importance of this story is to share the importance of mentoring and maybe taking somebody on the fence and bringing them back over to our side. Go ahead and roll it, Brian. Well, we're back again this week with an interesting twist on the new ham. Now I'm going to introduce you to David W4LBG from Virginia. Now he's an extra class license ham so don't don't go tuning out and say what happened to old christian he kind of he lost his way what happened was david has elmered a new technician friend of his and i think the story is very cool so i want to welcome at this time david thanks for coming on and telling your side of this story and through this process we'll meet the new ham thanks for having me christian pleasure to be here Mm -hmm. I think it's great, and what I've found is that the Elmering 
is such an important thing. And for those who are new to ham radio, Elmer's is a term we use uh, as sort of a mentor, someone to help guide you from stepping right. in all the possible pitfalls and traps. I mean, <laughs> we do we do want to spend a lot of money sometimes, and they can say, you know what, slow down, it's, it's right. fine. So you've taken on Elmering Travis. Travis will meet in just a little bit. He's KK4EDW. Um, why do you feel, or why did you feel it was important to help Travis along? Travis had told me in previous months, he's a, he's a good friend of mine, uh, been a good friend of mine for I think close to five years now. And uh, when he told me, I guess it's back around Christmas time, that uh, he had started at one point studying for general and had been maybe discouraged by some local hams and local club like can happen sometimes. Uh, I felt it was an obligation as a ham to see if I could bring him back into the swing of things because we all know that when you get your general class, uh, the world of HF opens up, and HF has been really good to me. I've had so much fun and learned so much, and I knew that if I could get him onto HF that first time, then the bug would bite him, and that's exactly that's exactly uh, what happened. Frankly, you threw him in the deep end. I mean, there's nothing like getting involved in a pileup as your first. So it's not like you said, look, let's send an email to a guy. I have a friend. He's somewhere, and uh, we'll just meet up on right. that frequency, and you'll make the contact, which is totally yep. good, fine way of doing things. You were sure. like, you know what? Let's get in the middle of a, a you know, a competition, throw sure. you in there, and let's let's see what you can do, kid. Right. I mean, it, it's also the fact that I knew there were going to be a plethora of DX stations on the air for that weekend, and you know, if I had brought them down any old day, you know, we might have made a contact, we might not have, but I knew this was a surefire way to uh, get him on HF and get him working some DX. And, uh, yeah, it, it was pretty much a deep end treatment, like you said. But at the same time, you know, sometimes if you don't take that first step, then you'll never go forward. So you did it right. I mm -hmm. applaud you for your effort on getting Travis his first. I think you've what Thanks. Dr. Bob says, I, you know, he gave me this disease. It's true. It's one we don't want to shake particularly. We enjoy it. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think you really did give uh, Travis a good shot of this disease. So well done. Good on you, man. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go meet Travis. And here he is, the new ham. Everybody's been waiting for the new ham. We've been dealing with an Elmer for <laughs> I don't know how many minutes now. We've actually got the new hand, ham here. Travis, KK4EDW. Congratulations. I know you've been a technician for a while. Yes. But what really made you turn the corner now in, in terms of maybe pursuing this a little deeper? Or maybe a better question is, why did you kind of hang out for a while? Well, I originally started uh, ham radio with the intentions of doing Skywarn and also local emergency management. And it wasn't really ever my intention to do anything in terms of DXing or really communicating much on a regular basis. Uh, but in the last several weeks, I've been getting attuned to the... Uh, uh, a group of individuals here in Central Virginia on 220, and that's been a lot of fun. Uh, kind of rekindled a, a couple of stray contacts prior on two meters, and then when uh, W4LBG, when David uh, suggested to me about coming down and checking out this contest uh, just to see what it was all about, I went in with an open mind, but not much expectation, I guess. Uh, the reason I turned the corner, I just felt it was neat to get exposed to another part of the hobby aside from my original intentions in hand radio for emergency communications. And I think it goes without saying that after the experience, uh, pretty much got me hooked, uh, being able to put everything together uh, piece by piece that I've been learning over the last couple of years. Let's take a look. This, you know, it was, it's wonderful that this was recorded. Let's take a look at the video of you making your first HF contact. Kilo Kilo 4 Echo Delta Whiskey. Kilo 4 again. Kilo Kilo 4 Echo Delta Whiskey. Kilo Kilo 4 Echo Delta Whiskey. 5 9 Kilo. 5 9 Victor Alpha, thank you. Thank you. You are that. Papa X Ray 5 Echo. So there you have it. Travis KK4EDW making his first HF contact. And uh, tell me about the feelings. I know you, th it's something that hams will say they never forget. Tell me the feeling for you. It really was just 
it was almost a feeling of accomplishment. It really felt like I turned the corner in the hobby and really got into something new just beyond two meters or 220 or whatnot. And just the fact that I talked to somebody in you know, my first contact in Brazil, uh, you know, you can read all the magazines you want, you can get all the information you want, the tidbits, and but so you actually do it, it really doesn't come together. And I think also that moment of my first contact was a real moment of clarity and getting all those loose pieces I've accumulated over the years and from what I've heard, uh, finally it all came together and it made sense. And I think that was a lot of the uh, initial uh, excitement and still something I carry with me after you know, the, that day of the contest. Let's take a look at a contact that happened. You made a lot of contacts on this particular day during this DX contest, unique DX entities. Let's take a listen and a look on this one that was that was pretty, pretty good, Travis. <laughs> Thanks so much, Delta. Good luck. You are red. Zulu, Kilo, one, Victor, Victor. Kilo, Kilo, four, Echo Delta, Whiskey. Five nine Virginia, thank you. Thanks for Virginia. Is that VA? QSL. QSL. Thank you. QSL. Look at what this is. If this is what I think it is. Zero one Victor Victor. You just done good, son. <laughs> wow! You just went a third of the way wow. around. Wow! Now I'm going after it. Go, go get him, go get him. <laughs> Darn. So, Travis, that's ridiculous. So, <laughs> the excitement, the fist pumping, it I jumped up out of my seat. I was thinking, man, this is like hitting the three-pointer at the buzzer. And it's South Africa, and it's confirmed. I mean, what was that like? If nothing was going to, if you had a hook kind of right here on your lip, I think hitting South <laughs> Africa just, you know, it's all, the, it had to get you, right? It really did, and I think that was kind of the, the second moment where I realized, okay, this is going to be a lot of fun. All I remember, it happened very quickly, and I know that once David said, oh, the window's open, we got to go for it, he went for it, handed me the mic, and then I went for it, and then we just kind of looked at each other like, we just hit South Africa 8,000 miles away on 100 watts. And then it kind of sunk in. And then I think that was the moment where, being on the initial excitement of the first contact, that's when I realized just how amazing the simple technology of ham radio is. The fact that I can be 8,000 miles from somebody, hear them very clearly, and make a contact. And that was just Again, almost like, okay, foundation was built in first contact. Now the house is on top and we're ready to go. And that was only my sixth contact. Okay. The South Africa contact was only my sixth. Yep. Yeah, rub it in a little bit, Travis. I, <laughs> I don't have South Africa on my log, and I'm thinking about hanging up on you right about now. But anyway, I, I just want to congratulate you on that, and I hope that you will continue on the path to HF and, uh, you know, getting your rig and getting your antennas up. It seems like you got a good guy and a good buddy there helping you out. And uh, long may you run, man. I, I hope we get to work you down the line a little bit. Thank you. I'm very appreciative for David and all those who have helped me along the way become a ham operator with confidence. I think that's the big key is having someone who's willing to help you along the way. And certainly I hope that our paths may cross uh, on some bandwidth someday in, in the very near future. Travis, KK4EDW. 7-3, buddy. 7-3 to you as well. There you go. Wow. There you go. I mean, wow. I think that really shows the importance of Elmering, and I know I couldn't do it alone. I mean, I've got three great guys who have the patience to just uh, listen to me, and you could see the excitement. I mean, that that video is really priceless, I think. And uh, So I don't know. I think the reaction of you you all, you guys are, are part of my Elmer team. So uh, what did you think? Uh -huh. I awesome. loved it. <laughs> Crazy, right? Yeah. Insane. Really great. Yeah, and it's really great. And miles the thing is, it, he wasn't afraid of the microphone. He jumped in and grabbed a hold of it. And yes, he had his Elmer sitting beside him, but uh, he made the contact. It, it, a lot of those things uh, happen with the, uh, the Elmer kind of making it, but uh, he did it. And uh, man, that... <laughs> That was really great, and uh, I appreciate you putting that all together. And who knows what's coming next, Gordo? What do you think about that? That's pretty good, huh? 
Well, we need more kids, and what a great way for Elmering kids to Elmer more kids. And uh, wow, Kristen, thanks so much for a great show. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the super- opportunity. You know, somebody asked what he did it with, and it was a it was a dipole. He was a hundred watts barefoot. <laughs> oh wow! And it was a dipole. He just had the right pro- pro- propagation, and and things went his way. It was great. Yeah. That's what I've been telling you, Christian. Just put that stupid <laughs> thing up and see what happens. Exactly. <laughs> I put the problem oh, is boy. I put well, another one up and another <laughs> one up and another one up. I got another tree, maybe. So yeah, it's, it's okay. It, yeah. Antennas are an, an interesting thing to me right now. But I, you know, I this mentoring thing. If it, uh, you know, if you're not getting Elmered, you know, and he was on the fence. He was pretty much going to pack it in, and and you know, he was just going to do some stuff on the periphery of ham radio and he his buddy was like no i think i can help and and that's what happened so it's a cool story (laughs) well thanks for doing that we'll look forward to uh to seeing more stories and anyone that um if you're a new ham or uh, get a hold of christian uh let's uh, get you in here that's how you get on the show we'd love to have you and hear your story about what you're doing in ham radio don what do you think about that? Was that pretty cool or what? Oh, man, to have a hands-on Elmer like that. Uh, oh, yeah, just just the best. I, It's been so long, I don't remember exactly my first HF contact. But, uh, but yeah, I, w- I was scared to death even being a broadcaster for, you know, 30-something years. I was, everybody's a little bit mic shy, I think, the first few times because you're not, especially HF is, can be intimidating can be very, I mean, you start off on the repeaters, the two meter, 440 repeaters, whatever, and HF can be very intimidating. But the thing is, just get in there and do it, man. That's that's the important thing. Just jump in with both feet, get good and wet, and just, uh, you know, come on in. The water's fine, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, dokie. Well, let's see what's going on in, uh, with the news. You, you do have news today, don't you, Mr. Don? You know, as a matter of fact, I do. Let's roll that now. From Amateur Radio Newsline Report, number 1,958, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, April 1st, 2015. Ham radio access to six meters in Thailand has become a thorny issue. Thailand's National Broadcasting and Telecommunications Commission, or NVTC, is considering a new national frequency master plan, one with the twin objectives of strengthening national security while also planning new broadband telecommunication services for the future. The new master plan sees reallocation of 50 to 54 megahertz to the Army to enforce national security. But a conflict soon cropped up from a decision last year to allocate 50 to 54 megahertz to Thai amateur radio operators. The Army, which has been using the spectrum for emergencies, opposed the move. Because of this, the NBTC has yet to allow amateur radio operators the use of the 6-meter band, given the protests from the military. Now, if the National Broadcasting and Telecommunications Commission goes forward with the new master frequency plan as proposed, it would appear as if Thailand's army will be getting its way and hams will not gain access to the 6-meter band. For the Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Bill Pasternak, WA6ITF in Los Angeles. The International Amateur Radio Union has approved the publication of an emergency telecommunications guide and has made it available on the organization's website. Skeeter Nash and 5ASH has more. This handbook was developed to provide the IARU member societies with materials suitable for training their members to participate in emergency events. It is also designed to provide guidance to the individual amateur radio operator who has little or no experience in handling emergency communications but desires to enhance his or her ability to participate in such events or to simply have a better understanding of the process. The publication can also be used in conjunction with other training materials by leaders within the emergency communication community to train radio operators in the basic theory and practice of handling emergency communications traffic. You can download the 93-page guide in PDF format at the URL you'll find in the full edition of this week's Amateur Radio Newsline report. In Amateur Radio business news, Venture has been sold to Vibraplex. The Venture Amateur Radio product lines have been sold to Vibraplex, LLC of Knoxville, Tennessee. This includes the Venture BY series of iambic paddles, the ST series of single lever paddles, the Venture hex paddle, the N2DAN mercury paddle, and the Venture RJ series hand keys. Also included in the sale are the HK1 universal hookup kit and the YA1 low-pass filter. 
Viberplex says that it will continue to offer the Venture products through existing marketing channels. It has also agreed to honor the manufacturer's warranties of all covered products and to offer parts and support for those products as well. Viberplex may be contacted at www.viberplex.com. And speaking of Morse code... Dan Romanchik, KB6NU, has announced the publication of his new book titled The CW Geek's Guide to Having Fun with Morse Code. His new CW Geek's Guide to Having Fun with Morse Code is all about helping hams learn Morse, assisting in finding a key that's right for them, and showing them how to get on the air. It also teaches hams how to use abbreviations, cue signals, and pro signs properly. The CW Geek's Guide to Having Fun with Morse Code is available in several different formats. These include a PDF, Nook, or Kindle ebook versions directly from KB6NU.com. The paperback copies can be purchased through Amazon.com. The ebook versions cost $2.99, while the paperback is priced at $7. And finally, as we reported last week, the FCC is planning to cut its Enforcement Bureau staff in half and close three-quarters of its field offices, replacing them with so-called Tiger Team Strike Forces. But Newsline's April 1st roving correspondent Pierre Pullen My Leg reports that that's only the tip of the iceberg. We have learned from our confused sources that the FCC's proposed enforcement Tiger teams will be only part of a menagerie of planned strike forces, including lion, leopard, cheetah, and chimpanzee teams. Each of these will be devoted to enforcing FCC rules in a particular radio service, representing in total a titanic new response to lawlessness upon the airwaves. Beginning next April 1st, Enforcement in the amateur service will be the responsibility of the FCC chimpanzee team strike force. These special agents will leap into action whenever a rules violation is detected on the handband, going bananas and swinging from tower to tower until the violator is brought to justice. The ultimate goal, according to newly named team chief Sam Simeon, is to make it coconut clear to the amateur radio community that the FCC means business and that hands who monkey around with the rules will eventually slip up and be brought down. From the Primate Pavilion at the Bronx Zoo, this is Pierre Poulimelec reporting for Newsline. Hey, give me back my banana! Pierre provides us with stories that have great uh, appeal. Can't wait to hear his follow-up about 365 days from today. And that's all from the Amateur Radio News Line, your independent source for amateur radio news for over 37 years and counting at www.arnewsline.org. For Bill Pasternak, WA6ITF, Skeeter Nash, N5ASH, and Pierre Pullen My Leg, call and parts unknown. I'm Don Wilbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. Now here's Dr. Tamitha Scove with the solar update. Hi, I'm Tamitha Scove with your solar storm forecast for the week of March 30th. Well, it's been nearly two weeks since that monster solar storm that we had back on St. Paddy's Day, and the sun has really quieted down. We're enjoying a well-deserved rest because all we're basically getting are a few filament eruptions here and there. Now, we thought we had Region 2305 that was going to give us a few flares and, and start becoming a more active contender, but it really hasn't manifested. The biggest we've seen is that gorgeous prominence eruption there, which actually lengthened the, that coronal hole and we have a threat for some solar storming because of some fast wind coming from those coronal holes. But that's about it. Switching to our M-flare threat meter, you can see the last time we actually had an M-flare was clear back on the 18th. That's when that old region 2297 actually was rotating around the west limb. Since then, it's been incredibly quiet. We thought we were going to get something from region 2305. As you can see, the flares picked up a little bit right around the 25th, but then they've died back down again. And it doesn't look like we're going to see anything anytime soon. Now, switching to your storm levels, you can see the huge impact of that monster geomagnetic storm that happened over St. Paddy's Day. And on the back side of that storm, as it began to calm down on the 18th, it was compounded by a high-speed stream that had some fast wind in there. And so it just made the effects of that storm linger on day after day. And then we'd have little minor disturbances, little wispy solar storms in the solar wind that would just pop us back over storm levels because it never really got the, gave the Earth's field a chance to kind of settle down. And now only since about the 23rd or 24th have we started to really see the field settle back down uh, and go back into a normal condition. Switching to your solar flare and particle radiation <coughs> storm outlook over the coming days, NOAA is giving us about a 25% chance for an M-class flare over the coming week from regions 2305 and also some new growth in region 2315. Now, both of these could be really low-level M-flare contenders over the coming days. However, they're not strong enough to be giving us any threat for particle radiation storms at this time.
So the storm possibilities for this week are actually looking pretty good. We may not have any solar ejections coming at us, but because of those two coronal holes, we do have an enhanced uh, fast wind that will be slamming us over the next couple days or so. NOAA is predicting that we might even have a very strong solar storm up at high latitudes because of this fast wind which is great for aurora photographers. We might even see aurora coming down to about mid-latitudes, but you ham radio operators and GPS operators, you may have issues sporadically over the next few days or so. And then things should begin to settle down again. I'm Tamitha Scove. Thank you for watching. All right, good stuff from uh, from Dr. T. Of course, she's going to be at the Dayton Antenna Forum on uh, Dayton Friday, which, uh, as you know now, if you were watching earlier, will be... Uh, shown live, streamed live on the ICOM America website. Speaking of antennas, I want to show you some broadcast antennas, some towers. Uh, let's go to that. That's uh, KOKC. Used to be KOMA. That's Oklahoma City. About a week ago, in fact, last Wednesday, just before the show, next one, uh, those antennas were knocked down. There's a great aerial shot. Those antennas were up since 1946, I believe. And if we go to the next one, We'll uh, get an idea of just exactly what that tornado did. It knocked the, the two outside towers down, folded the middle one in half. Next one, please. And uh, that's and it's just dangling there. It's actually uh, kind of swinging in the wind. And here's the cool thing. The engineering team, uh, next shot, please. The engineering team, uh, there it is. Uh, that's uh, Tower 1, um, tumped over. The engineering team led by Randy Mullinax, 85RM. He was my very first chief engineer. And there are a couple of hams on his engineering staff. And there he is in 1975. So uh, 40 years previously, putting the first Harris MW1 on the air in Oklahoma. So uh, congratulations to Randy Mullinax for getting that radio station back on the air. In less than 24 hours, they were back on the air at 10,000 watts wow. with that bent over antenna, which I think is uh, is quite a feat. Is, and, uh, is and quite really, a feat. And, and only a bunch of hams could figure out how to do that, don't you think? So uh, it's good stuff. Now let's uh, get over into our, our, our other broadcast engineer. That would be George Thomas and see what's going on with Smoke and Solder. George, pretty amazing stuff, huh? Yeah, pretty amazing stuff. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe those towers were wind chargers. Uh, they used to be real popular um, back back in that time period. I don't know when the last one was made, but uh, anyway. I know two, of them were, two of them were Blon Ox. Two of those three were Blon Ox towers. Okay. Okay. Uh, could have been. I didn't know Blomox uh, made anything that wasn't, uh, you know, of the uh, triangular. Diamond. Yeah. Variety. No, they did. Yeah, they made some square profiles. Cool. Uh, well, on Smoke and Solder tonight, we're going to pick up where I left off a couple of weeks ago. You know, I was building this little kit here, and we didn't get around to testing it out. So let's do that this week. The last time we got together, I built this little Ambino keyer from AE9RB. It's made to fit onto an Arduino, in this case an Uno, and give us several functions. This week, we're going to check it out. The first thing we need to do before we plug this into our Arduino is take a resistance measurement across capacitor C3 in here. We should measure 3.1K ohms, plus or minus 20%. 3.27K, that's close enough. So now I can put the display back on. There's a couple other things we need to do before we plug this into our Arduino. One of the first ones, though, is to load our sketch or our program into the Arduino. And I ran into a little problem here. You've got to follow the instructions carefully. You download the zip file, and then you unzip it into a folder named Iambino. And that's got to be under the root folder of your hard drive. Otherwise, you'll get compile errors when you try to upload it to your Arduino. Once you've got it in the right place, though, it should download right on into the UNO. Once that's done, we can install our IMBino shield onto the UNO. Be careful not to get your pins crooked. And then we can apply power, and we're ready to go. We can adjust R12 under the display here to set the contrast correctly. If all worked out right, then we're going to see Iambino and however many words per minute the pot is set to. That's a good initial sign. Now let's just look at a few of the things here that we've got. There are four push buttons here that are used for recording and playback of messages. And then there's a fifth one here that's used to select our settings mode. If we press that, we're into the settings and we've got several here. We use the outside black buttons here to scroll through them. 
First, we see speed, 18 words a minute. Of course, that's adjustable right here on the pot. The next thing, speed minimum, 5 words per minute, or maximum 40 words per minute. Uh, message banks, we've got two different message banks in here, 1 and 2. Use the center two buttons here to scroll between those two, or any choices through the menus. Next, we select our mode. We can select iambic, automatic, bug, or straight key. And I'm going to put it on, well, since I don't have any of these others, all I've got is a straight key. So let's just put it on straight key and see what happens. But on through the rest of the settings here, we've got memory type B, dot, dash, or type A. I'm not even sure what that means. I'm going to have to look that one up. The next setting we've got is spacing. We can set that for element, character, word, or none. And element was the default. Next, we've got weighting. And by default, it's set on 50%, but you can use the center two buttons here to adjust it however you would like. Then paddle, you've got the choice of normal or reverse. That means if you've got your paddles connected backwards, you can just put it on reverse right there. Transmit lag, zero milliseconds is the default. That means if it takes the transmitter a little while to get keyed up before it can start sending, you can set a delay right there. The tone frequency for the side tone, volume, which adjusts the volume of the side tone speaker there, and transmit side tone, choices of on or off. We'll leave it on so we can hear the speaker. Backlight, it's on six, looks plenty bright to me. And then back to speed again. To get out of the settings, we just press the red button again, and we're back to operating mode. There are connectors on the board for headphones, your radio, or a key. Now, let's just plug in our straight key here and see if it even works. Seems to. Of course, it, it's a straight key. You do your own dots and dashes with that. Now, unfortunately, to record memories in here, you can't do them with a straight key. And a straight key is all I've got, so we're going to have to get a little creative here to try this thing out a little further. I've only got the one strike key here, so we're going to have to use a push button for the other side of the paddle. If we press our code key, we've got dits. If we press a switch, we've got dos. Now, I'm not a code junkie. I can't really even send Morse code, but we're going to play with this anyway. And I've programmed in some messages already in the number one bank, so let's just take a look at those. In the number one position... I call sign the number two position. Just a little CQ. Number three. Signal report five nine and number four. Seventy three. So I can send all of those with just a single push of a button here. Now let's look at actually recording one into it. The first thing we'll do is hold down whichever button it is we want to record and let, let's re-record the CQ. So we'll hold down button number two. It says record two. And let's just key it in here with our crude paddle. And to finish recording, we just hit the button again. Let's see if it took. So there you go. The IMBino. A nice little Arduino CW project. Well, that was a lot of fun to put together, and, and like I said, I can't even send CW, but I managed to, uh, to, to use the key and the push button there, sort of as a paddle. I've never used a paddle before, but it uh, seems like that would be the way to go. Well, you know, last week I asked a question, which of the following describes combining speech with an RF carrier signal? And your choices were A, impedance matching, B, oscillation, C, modulation, or D, low-pass filtering. And this came from the amateur radio technician's exam. And we had a winner. It is Jim, KW6JIM. And he said, George, the answer is C, modulation. You're correct, Jim. So we're going to send you this MFJ1712S. It's a telescopic antenna you can use for 2 meters or 440 on your handy talkie. 
and it's got a male SMA connector on it, which means it fits the more popular handy talkies. And we're also going to throw in a, a little universal handy talkie carrier here that'll fit any handy talkie you've got and just clip it on your belt. For next week, uh, I've got another question here, and that's besides telegraph and radio, what did B.F. Skinner do with the code key? Now, if you think you know the answer to that, send your answer to me at hamnationcontest at gmail.com, and you could win this Howl cap and a Howl t-shirt. We're going to send both out to uh, next week's lucky winner. So get your answer into me, uh, hamnationcontest at gmail.com. And once again, the question was, Besides telegraph and radio, what did B.F. Skinner do with a code key? And it's kind of a weird answer there. So uh, get your answers on into me, and we'll see who wins next week. And right now, it's time for a message from ICOM. Out from the shack and into the sun. Brighten your day with ICOM's selection of handhelds, mobiles, and HF rigs. Step outside with ICOM's ID51A Plus Digital Dual Bander. Features include free downloadable RSMS1A Android app, near me repeater function for D-Star as well as analog repeaters, and integrated GPS. Hit the road with ICOM's analog IC2730A mobile or the digital ID5100A with internal GPS. Both radios include optional Bluetooth capability for a hands-free operation, 50 watts output power on both VHF and UHF, and a large backlit screen for high contrast viewing. Get mobile with ICOM's IC7100 D Star Radio, which provides multi band and all mode communications, and an angled control head and touchscreen for user friendly operation. For solid HF operation this season, try ICOM's IC7600. This rig offers advanced DSP technology and three IF roofing filters, dual watch on the same band and LED backlighting on an ultra-wide 5.8-inch display. Let ICOM brighten your day with their selection of handhelds, mobiles, and HF rigs. Make sure you visit icomamerica.com amateur today for more information on ICOM's complete line of amateur radio products. And you can tune in and enter to win after each episode of Ham Nation. Go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation. Throw your name in the hat for some great swag prizes like T-shirts and hats. And learn how you can win the monthly grand prize drawing for a new radio. Go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation for the official rules and to check out all of ICOM's previous drawing winners like March's grand prize winner, who is colon A, KI4QJO, and Colin's going to be receiving a brand new IC2730A analog dual band mobile. And for April, the grand prize is going to be the ID51A dual band dual watch handy talkie with D Star built in GPS, near repeater lift step, micro SD card for voice and data storage and data cloning, plus a whole lot more. So go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation after this and every episode of Ham Nation. Throw your name in the hat. Who knows? You you could be the lucky winner. And, Bob, you know, we're going to be doing um, the Leo's show with him Saturday morning from Dayton Hamvention. And Tommy and I will be doing Amateur Logic on Saturday afternoon at Hamvention from uh, 2 to 4 p.m. over in the ICOM booth. So going to be a, um, a, a full day of Hamvention fun streamed online that Saturday. Isn't that true? Yeah, we're very excited. By the way, you, do you need to borrow this? I think because I do. You, you need you this? Saw, you saw what I was using. That's not, not very easy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 1959, I got a hold of this, uh, Vibroplex and uh, so ever. So very good. And, George, I finally got the um, – the, there you go. Yeah. Super duper. <laughs> I, I finally got the uh, – PR10 project going, you know. Hey, no, yeah, there's a real CW operator. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What That's can I like tell that. you? you know, <laughs> they all work. So there you go. It all depends on what's going on. But uh, George, yeah, what, you, you know my, my whole uh, 
thought about desk stands. I hate them because they allow, people get, oh, they get way back here and look what happens to the audio. Well, we'll just crank it up and then you hear the whole room. That doesn't work. So we finally got this together. Now you have a desk stand with a boom and you don't have to lean into it. Isn't that cool? So That is cool. Yeah, and you know, Bob, I, I got a couple of those in the uh, mail today that we're going to be giving away in the future. We are. A and the push to talk button it lights yeah. up when you sweet oh baby or nice. if you want to be cool you can uh, switch it so that it just stays on when you want to uh, impress your friends as they come in the station oh we've been thinking i mean we've been doing it yeah 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 <laughs> oh i love it but the best thing is this microphone it's a baby 740 uh, 781 it's really really good and a little bitty guy. So we are going to thank you very much for all of that, George. I know it's a lot of work you do, and we're looking forward to fun at Dayton. Oh, boy. But we also are going to have, I think, Miss Valerie. Valerie, how are you? It's nice to be with you here. Are you doing okay? I, I think, I, how long has it been since we've been on a show together, Bob? It's been a while, I think. I don't know, a long time. And and <laughs> do we have an anniversary tonight? Tonight is my one year anniversary. And you know how I know? Because I was getting, I was putting on my Wisconsin sweatshirt because they're in the final four, just like they were a year ago. And that's when I started my first show on Ham Nation. So I do have to do a shout out to my Badgers, my alma mater. Uh, again, they're playing Kentucky again. Hopefully they won't lose by one point this year in the final four. But uh, <laughs> yep. One year ago today, I started Ham Nation, and what a ride it's been. Well, we're very, very honored to have you. So many emails and phone calls and people on the air. Uh, they, they respect uh, your knowledge and your presence. You're, you're just so good, and uh, we, uh, we want you to tell us a little bit about what's going on in the wonderful world of DX. All right. Well, I don't have any kind of information video for you this week. Uh, we just got back from Foreland. We were down there last week. Um, but um, as far as DX goes, uh, if you want to show that first uh, photo, Brian, hopefully you got those. Um, nope, not that one. But I want to show that one at the end. Get that off of there. Well, um, South Georgia, um, VP8 Delta Oscar Zulu. That guy's still there. You know, he's still working on that world's largest rat eradication, eradication project. Now, he's on 18160 every night at 2030 through 2300 Zulu. Now, he's not necessarily calling CQ. So if you get on that frequency at in that time zone or time and you call him, he will most likely come back to your call and give you a QSO. And the reason he's not calling CQ, I mean, that's a very rare DX entity. And I want to show you the equipment he's working with if you want to show that next uh, photograph. That is a commercial HF radio. And what he has to do when he's working you is hold that handset and type at the same time. So it's pretty hard to call CQ and run a pileup. So if you need South Georgia, make sure you get on uh, 18160 uh, at 2030 through 2300 Zulu and uh, work him and get him on 17 meters. Also coming up in about 10 hours at uh, 1200 Zulu uh, is... Uh, okay, I hope I don't botch the name. I looked it up on Wikipedia how to pronounce this thing, and it says to not say the end. So Tridati is is the way it looks like it's supposed to be pronounced. Tridati Island. Um, they're only going to be there a few days. They're hitching a ride with the Brazilian Navy, so they're on their time uh, frame. So they can only be there a, a few days, and that is number 29 on the DX most wanted list. And if you notice Trinidadi in and that mountain in the background, if that looks kind of familiar, it could be because back in the 70s, they photographed some UFOs on Trinidadi. And it's probably one of the most famous photographs of a UFO. If you go to a library and check out a book on UFOs, you're going to see that picture right there in probably every UFO book you check out. Just a little fun fact about Trinidadi. Now, as... This is not really a contest or um, 
Well, kind of a contest. It might be something to try if you're looking to try something new, expand your uh, ham radio wings. Um, they have every Tuesday and Thursday night, there's the QRP CW Fox Hunt, and they're on 80 and 40 meters. So you have to go on your radio and try and find this QRP signal. And it sounds like fun. A lot of my friends up at the GMDXA group, uh, they do this all the time. So if you want more information on it, there's their website, qrpfoxhunt.org. Uh, if you're into fox hunting, it might be a fun thing for you to do. Now, as far as contesting goes on, we had a real big one this last weekend. WPX Sideband was on. Um, unfortunately, we didn't participate. We were on vacation, but uh, I did a little bit Sunday when we got home. But uh, that was a really fun one. As a matter of fact, I, we won first place USA. That was one of my pl plaques on the wall there. But um, there's a lot of CUSO parties going on right now. This weekend, we have Mississippi. Montana and Missouri. Uh, hopefully, Bob, are you going to be on for the Missouri CUSA party? Of course, it's 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 the three m work a uh, three uh, m uh, weekend, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no Maine or Maryland, but uh, yeah. And uh, you county hunters, I mean, I'm sure there's some counties there you need, probably especially in Montana. Um, also, I did want to say the 15 meter sing. Uh, uh, slow scan TV dash contest is also this weekend. So you slow scan TVs are. TVers out there, or if you've always wanted to try it, now's the time to get on and uh, work a lot of people out there. Also wanted to let you know about a DX group. They're called the North American DX Association. They actually uh, offer bus service to and from Dayton, from the New York or New Jersey area, to and from Dayton at cost. They're not going to make any money on that. So uh, if you need it, to hitch a ride to Dayton and back, uh, you should check it out. Or if you're a DXer and want to learn about their organization, they are D-A-X, or I'm sorry, N-A-D-X-A.org. And that's all I have for today. Sorry, it's so short, but we were running long, so that probably worked out. So I am going to head it over to Amanda and see what questions she has from you guys in the chat room. Hey, thanks, Val. Uh, I have some great questions tonight. Nice to have you back tonight. I hope you had a great vacation. Uh, Bob, let's go to you first. Um, the first question we have is from Pedro, CT1FCX. He says, uh, which would you recommend for a 160-meter band? Uh, would you prefer an inverted V dipole or a delta loop? Oh, if you have the room, just put up a good old dipole. It's very difficult to beat a dipole. Uh, the delta loops, you got to play with them to make them work because uh, some of it's in phase, out of phase, and it's so tough. Uh, they're not easy to, to control. They work good once you get them all up, so I'm, don't have to worry about it. Just put up a good old dipole and make it happen. But it's got to be a full-length resonant dipole, 160 is tough. But uh, you do that, and you'll be in good shape, and we'll join you there because I'm on 160 a lot late night. Very good. Thanks. And uh, KD5DPK would like to know, are you ever going to give us a video tour of the Heil plants? It would be good to do if I ever get back there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm usually back a day or two, and, and they kick me out to come back design more stuff but uh yeah we'll do that sometime when i get a little bit of time there that's the problem is getting the uh getting the time uh to, to, to videotape some of it maybe i should have christian there there's the answer amanda we'll have christian come back and do it <laughs> all right that sounds awesome can't wait to see that one and uh mr will Binks, i have a question for you uh this pertains to amateur radio newsline and Mike, KB3BYJ would like to know if he set up a low power repeater using HTs and wanted to transmit Newsline over it, can he get a brief explanation of what, if anything, he would need to do to keep within the laws when transmitting it? Yeah, absolutely. We, we make it fairly easy to do that. Um, you just go to arnewsline.org, arnewsline.org, and you will see uh, you can download the script and you can download the audio. The audio is in MP3 format. And uh, uh, the audio goes about 25 minutes on average. And of course, before we hit the 10 minute mark, there is a pause to uh, put in your ID because you have to ID at least every 10 minutes on amateur radio. So uh, before you hit the ID mark, there will be uh, a pause, a five second pause for you to put your ID in. And then again, 
Uh, after the second segment, before the third segment, will be another five-minute pause, or five-second pause to throw your ID in. Now, the only problem with doing this with an HT is um, it's pretty long. I mean, if you're going you're gonna to be transmitting for 10 minutes solid, and that's probably not that good with an HT. Uh, but if, I mean, if you want to set up a repeater or any station, any repeater, or even a simplex machine that, that can handle, you know, a long uh, transmit interval, to, uh, to transmit amateur radio newsline, you can do that. I used to do it uh, in New Orleans when I was net control for the New Orleans VHF club before I had a mixer and uh, a, a radio that I could port that audio into. I used to just take my hand mic and hold it uh, in front of the, the computer speaker. And then eventually I, I put a rubber band around it and, and figured out how to do it that way so I wouldn't get writer's cramp or, you know, hand clamp cramp holding that microphone. But it's very easy to do. It's just uh, it takes a little perseverance, especially if you're going to do it with, a, with an HT. And I probably wouldn't recommend doing an HT because that 10-minute uh, that broadcast or 10-minute transmit interval would be pretty rough on an HT. So, But that's, that's as easy as it, as it gets for if you want to transmit amateur radio news line on your net or or a simplex uh, machine, repeater, whatever. That's how you do it. Very good. And uh, there you go, Mike. Uh, you also have your technical help desk if you come into problems with that as well. Thanks, Don, yeah, for that. I appreciate it. Just email it. me. Just there email me if you have any questions about that. I'm good on QRZ. Okay. And uh, before I get to Val, I had to make one announcement. I, this is the only one I had. KN0MAP. Dan upgraded to general a couple of weeks ago. And on the same day, his wife, Dorothy, got her technician license as well. So congratulations to her. KE0DNT. All right. Hey. It's, uh, glad to have them. And uh, Val, nice to have you back. I was really hoping for an April Fool's joke. You were going to tell us that you were going on some exotic de-expedition. Maybe that's really going to happen, and that's why you didn't tell us that it was an April Fool's joke? No, I hope someday to do that. But you know what I did want to show? Brian, do you want to show that one graphic, that the, the non-numbered graphic for me? That. Do you guys know what these guys all have in common? They do, are our net control operators. And I just want to say a big shout out and thank you. Those guys are out there every week helping to promote the show. And I do want to give a big thanks to those guys. And I believe next week... Dale has a big announcement that has to do with our net control operators. And so you're just going to have to tune in and find out what that's all about. Very awesome. Thanks, Absolutely. Val. Well, we, uh, we will look forward to their announcement because it's a biggie. And uh, you are exactly right, Valerie. They all maintain this show. If you haven't tuned in and uh, listen to the afternets. Oh my. And uh, George, what's the do drop in uh, echo link nodes that you can tune into? Actually, we don't have George on at the moment. Has anybody got those? Uh, the I can answer that. I that? can answer that. Yeah. Do drop in is oh. star do drop in star and it's node, uh, three, five, five, eight hundred. And on D star it's reflector 14 Charlie. So there you go. Okay. And thanks. The chat room dropped in there, too. Really enjoy the chat room. It's it's great. I can't always be there because we're doing all the other stuff. But thanks, everybody, for being there and helping us keep things alive. We're getting we're coming up to the 200th show. It's, it's just amazing when you think about what, uh, what's what been uh, accomplished here. And Leo Laporta uh, spoke last week, and he, he's so thrilled with everything that's going on. And uh, this is one of the top shows of the network. And one of the guys that makes that happen is a guy you don't see much, and that's Brian, because we cause him great pain because he's supposed to just sit there and have a couple of things. We usually have five or six different feeds and all these pictures and stuff, but uh, it's what makes this show interesting. So go get some wire from, uh, well, go down to Lowe's or Home Depot or whatever, get you some about number 12 or 14 copper wire, 486 divided by the frequency, cut it, put it up, and talk to us. And uh, that's all you got to do. All this Carolina Windhams and all of these hot dogs. No, just a resonant dipole. That's all you need. That's all you need. And you can hey, work the world. Bob, yep. I started off with speaker wire. I had some speaker wire that I used for my stereo in my basement. <laughs> and that was, I made a loop, a loop sky wire. And I made my first DX contact 
cats with my speaker wire. So you don't even need to go get special wire. It worked. No, it, no, not, right. I mean, the wire I'm talking about is just old 12 or 14 gauge for strength, really. But you're right, my dear. It'll work with just about anything. The key is it's got to be resonant. And then you don't need all these tuners and all this stuff and worry about this and that. Cut it to frequency. Don't have to worry about that. So, okay. And we'll uh, we'll bring you more on that subject again. But thanks for being here. I, I appreciate everybody being here tonight. And we'll um, we'll see you next week. I think I'll be here. We're going to be on the way to Visalia. But uh, you going to Visalia, Valerie? You and Jerry? I sure am. Two weeks yeah, from tomorrow. Are. Got it. Yep. We're looking forward to that. We'll get together and go have a hot dog somewhere, okay? <laughs> yeah, or a taco. In California, you got to have tacos. <laughs> That's right. All right. Well, take care, everybody. Have fun. Go uh, look the nets up now. Um, 14280, Steve will be there. 7286, you got to tune around a little bit because there's a lot going on in that portion of, of 40. But it'll be right in there. You won't have any trouble hearing them, let me tell you. And um, uh, Cheryl's at 3847. And you have all the rest of the uh, dewdrops and so on. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll uh, be back here next week. Bring some of your friends. And uh, enjoy amateur radio. It's the greatest hobby in the world. So long for now. We'll uh, talk to you next week right here on Ham Nation. This is K9EID. 